All right, everyone, for sake of time, we'll, uh, we'll kick this off here. Uh, do an introduction. Again, thank you very much for attending uh, this panel uh, discussion. Uh, my name is John Zavala. I'm a employment coordinator with Next Stop. Uh, just, just so you know, if you're not sure about Next Stop, uh, so Next Stop is a nonprofit organization uh, that supports veterans, uh, uh, just trying to provide uh, employment services, whether it be resume writing, uh, LinkedIn, or social uh, media assistance. Um, interview preparation, mentorship, and we just help bridge the gap between the veteran and employers out uh, here in the area. Um, so the rules of engagement for this, uh, this panel webinar, again, just keep your, your, uh, your keep, it, keep it on silent um, until you want to discuss, have any questions, uh, that way the panelists can, uh, can go ahead and, and, and go over the, uh, questions and everything. Again, if you have any questions, unmute it. And then once you're done, put it back to mute. Um, we also have a chat box uh, located here towards the bottom. If you have any questions, feel free to, to answer, put that on the uh, chat box and we'll go ahead and answer those questions. Uh, so again, so I'll kind of do a, a purpose about, uh, behind this uh, panel that I want to put together. Uh, so again, my name is John Zavala. I recently retired from the Marine Corps after 20 years. I'm really fresh from, from, uh, from my transition and uh, the purpose of this was to kind of go away from a slideshow or a webinar um, that we kind of, we all been going through. Um, I just wanted to, you know, talk, real, a real talk, I guess, a so social event virtually now, uh, so we can sit back and relax. Again, this is during lunchtime, so feel free to have, have your lunch, maybe a beverage. Um, it's just a time to get network and just talk about uh, our, our advice and what we went through for our transition our employment search. Um, so when I, when I was going through my transition, I, I was able to, uh, to attend the Next Stop uh, event. That event you know, it was, a good, it was an awesome event. They talked about resume writing, interview preparation, you know, all, that, all that resources and, and good stuff that I needed, needed to know to help me prepare for my transition. Uh, but the, the, what I got at the most was talking to the people that were also attended the, 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 uh, the seminar. It was about maybe seven to ten of us, and we discussed after the uh, after the seminar. We discussed our personal opinions, our personal situations going through our transition, and I left there feeling a lot better because I've I knew that some other people were going through the same same things I was going through. I was getting the no callbacks for for my applications. You know, I didn't have the best interview experience, uh, so I was maybe about a month into my transition of actually going through resumes and submitting them to applications. And at the time I wasn't getting any callbacks, any feedback. So I was really getting frustrated. And just attending that, that, uh, that seminar and talking to people, I left confident and I felt a lot better. So now, fortunately now I'm, I'm with Next Stop myself and I wanted to bring that back and actually, again, put those slideshows away and just talk about the experiences, um, any advice just to help you guys out and to make hopefully impact you and just making your transition maybe just a little bit, little bit easier. Um, so with that being said, I'm gonna introduce uh, our, our panelists today. Again, these are proven you know, military veterans transition um, success stories that we have on here. So they have a wealth of knowledge, wealth of experience. Uh, you know, first one we have is, is Kevin Rout. He's a 12 year army veteran. Uh, his MOS was 92 Fox, which is a petroleum supply specialist. He did leave uh, the Army in 2014, uh, so it was a couple years, uh, but again, he has that experience, and we'll talk about his experience as well. Uh, his current job is a social study teacher. He's a football and track coach for seventh and eighth grade. Uh, our second panelist we have is today is Craig uh, Kessip. I'm sorry. But, uh, he's a Marine Corps veteran, retired after 20 years. He is an Intel field, um, the Intel field MOS. Uh, he left in 2018, and he is currently a training facilitator uh, with Workforce Solution. So again, this those two alone have the experience, have the advice, and has it have they have a network. Uh, again, if you reach out to them, they have a, a wealth of resource. This them two alone. So I encourage you guys to reach out to them. We'll talk we'll talk about that here hereafter. But um, again, this is a, a, a source of knowledge here. Um, we also have from next up, we have Chris Cabanis, Army veteran. Uh, we have Dina Anderson, who will be 
uh, watching the chat room. Uh, if you still have any questions, text uh, chat with her and she'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and discuss those questions. Uh, she's an Air Force retiree. So again, been there, done that as far as the transition. Uh, we also have Patrick Manis, another Air Force retiree. Um, again, been there and he'll, he'll provide some insight on his end. Um, so with that being said, I'm gonna go over some questions and we'll kick off this, this panel. All right, so the first question I, I have is what were some of the things you did to prepare before you started the transition that had had positive results? So Kevin, I'll kind of start with you. Uh, what you do to prepare to have positive results? Well, for me, um, you know, um, I, I spoke to a lot of my friends who were civilians. Um, I mean, at least a year or two out, you know, and also uh, keeping in contact with those individuals even before then. And, uh, you know, education was a big thing. Uh, I used to always preach to, my, preach to my soldiers when I was a platoon sergeant and talk to them about the importance of going to school um, and, you know, taking advantage of the educational opportunities and benefits and whatnot prior to getting out. Because uh, just unfortunately, a lot of times when we wait to start that, a new or fresh, um, right? You know, after we get out, uh, it, it's it's more of an uphill battle, right? So that was one of the things that I did was uh, shore myself up with uh, as much education that I could, so that it would also couple with my military experience, right? Um, and again, uh, as I was transitioning out, I had two different uh, career fields that I was considering going into. Uh, to be honest with you, I was considering either one going into law school um, and pursuing that or going into education, which I've always been passionate about uh, my entire life. Uh, and I reached out to individuals um, who were friends of mine, who were civilians who had never served in the military, who had uh, that civilian or corporate experience in, in the law field and um, in education. And I just kind of put those things together. Um, and people who knew me outside the military, as well as uh, mentors that I had in the military. And um, that just kind of helped me to focus on where my, um, you know, where, where my next target was going to be um, as it relates to transitioning in, 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 into the civilian world. Okay, so your, your main focus for you personally was the, uh, the mentorship and the, the uh, education piece. Exactly. Yeah, you. mentorship and education, definitely speaking to people and uh, right. showing yourself up with the, 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 the appropriate education necessary. Right, okay. I'll move it to, uh, so Chris, do you have anything to add as far as your preparation, what you did? You said for me? Yes. Uh, I, I did kind of the same stuff that uh, that uh, Kevin did. Um, I I talked with people while I was getting out um, who were simplify. <laughs> who were in the fields that I wanted to, to pursue, and I tried I tried to get like a an overview of the pros and cons of each career field, and a lot of and I actually talked the the best thing I did actually was e even talking to recently transitioned veterans, and say hey how's your experience been out on the outside. And a lot of them uh, debunked that myth to me. Well, it's not completely a myth, but they're like, hey, man, it's not, it's not all six-figure salaries out here. You know, you got to prove yourself. You have to sometimes take that entry-level job. And so that was some actually good advice that someone gave me, you know, just get your foot in the door somewhere and grow with the company. And, you know, sometimes you do got to go to another job because you, need, you do need to make more money. But sometimes – it can be better, you know, if you start with a company and you, and you grow with them and you establish yourself. So those are some of the things that I did um, prior to getting out of the military, but I kind of had a, a clear picture of what I wanted to do. I knew that I joined the military because I wanted to go to college and I'm still continuing to do that right now and working at the same time. Okay, awesome. All right, so Craig, I'm gonna flip it a little bit here. Obviously I talk about the preparations, but what didn't work for you as far as what you did to prepare and what did you find out when you actually transitioned that wasn't really successful or didn't really work? Um, that, that's, a really, that's a really good question, um, John, because when, you, when uh, we look at everyone assuming what's going to happen when they get out, kind of like what, what Chris was saying, you know, like, you know, the big six-figure salaries and everything else, um, 
the, the thing that got me um, because you know I was in the Marine Corps for 20 years and all that kind of stuff. But you know, a lot of my peers, a lot of people that I work with was like, yeah, when I get out, I'm gonna go work for such and such agency or such and such government thing or such and such, you know, whatever, you know, what thing. And I was like, well, maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll try, but I don't know if that's really what I'm interested in. Um, let me see if I can figure it out. And, and just very much like Kevin, I have a, a background in education and training and, and, and mentoring and leadership. So I was like, well, let me see if that would be something I want to do. So um, I thought that, you know, maybe I would kind of take a left and wouldn't necessarily keep my foot in the door with the military side and, and kind of, you know, kind of move, move away. And uh, I looked into teaching and I looked into uh, JROTC. Um, and the mentality wise, what I didn't realize was that um, in the civilian world, for some people in some, some aspects, you kind of have to put that military piece kind of on the side, not, not away, not let it go, but um, you know, being a Marine and, and being a military person, um, in the, in the high school realm, I'm sure Kevin can definitely speak on this um, and working with civilians. I, I, what didn't work was being a Marine all the time. We, we're, we as Marines sometimes are taught, you know, you're Marine 24 seven. And I will always feel that, that the Marine Corps is very important to me. But, um, you know, a lot of times I would call people, you know, hey, Mr. Jones or, you know, Miss, Miss uh, Smith or Miss, you know, whatever. But what I learned from a lot of the people that I talked to was, hey man, just call me Mike. Hey, it's, it's Monica. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry, Miss Miss uh, Smith. No, no, no. It's Monica. Relax, relax. And uh, a lot of those employers talked to me too during interviews and things like that about how you know everybody knows a lot of times what the military person brings to the table. Um, and sometimes we and I assume too that oh maybe it's the negative stuff. But a lot of times what I learned was you know I have to relax a little bit. You have to kind of uh, like I, I used to have my head used to be shaved. This 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 is not the hair I used to have. But this is my friendly civilian side, you know. I had to to be able to to speak to people in a way that that isn't necessarily nicer, but in a way that that uh, isn't necessarily the way that you know you pull the knife hand out and you yell at somebody in the Marine Corps. Um, that that isn't always what you need to do. And uh, it was a, it was a good learning experience for me to uh, to understand different ways to be a mentor and different ways to receive um, feedback on a, on. A, on the, on the other side of the, the fence there, as far as uh, being a civilian. Great, okay, that's good. Um, so with all that, I'm gonna talk about struggles. We'll continue with that. Um, so me personally, my struggle uh, going, uh, starting off, um, I had the mentality of, it was my transition, my retirement, my job search, mine, mine, mine. So I had that tunnel vision and I had that, that perspective of just me, me, me. All right, so my, my early on struggle was I'm doing it by myself. It's just me, no one's helping me. Um, and obviously that was, that was the wrong way to do it. And that's why I struggled at first. It wasn't until I opened myself up and I realized all the resources, which we'll talk about here, here shortly, uh, but it wasn't until then um, that I started to, again, open up that tunnel vision. And I seen the big picture of all these people wanting to help me, willing to help me, wanting to talk to me, mentor me, and just guide me through a transition. So uh, that was my first initial struggle. Uh, so again, I wanted to talk about the struggles you had, your, your transition. Uh, we'll start off with, with Kevin. Um, well, kind of piggy, piggybacking on some of the things that Craig talked about. Um, so I'll start a little bit before I actually got out. And one of the struggles that I did have is, I remember when I was, uh, and I, I hope I'm not jumping on something she may speak on early, um, later, but uh, writing my resume, right? And at this point now, I've been told that I have a, a pretty good resume, a pretty decent resume. But as I was writing my resume, um, you know, upon exiting the military and transitioning, uh, before I, you know, finally ETS or whatnot uh, from the army, you know, I wanted to put platoon sergeant, squad leader, you know, so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, one of the, the struggles was trying to find the civilian synonyms for military jargon, right? That's a big thing. That's a big thing. Um, another thing is, uh, another thing piggy piggybacking on something that um, Craig said is, uh, you know, when you get out or as you're transitioning, not necessarily going for the thing that um, is all about the money, right? Um, you know, 
for us military folk, you know, we, we did what we did, you know, whether we did it initially forward or eventually, um, it was important for us to be doing something that we was passionate about, um, something that was important to us. And so I strongly encourage uh, anyone transitioning to find your niche um, as it relates to what, you know, the thing that, 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 that you're mo most passionate about. Um, and that's why I brought up the whole thing about me wanting to go to law school as opposed to uh, working in education. Um, because you will be faced with some struggles during interviews. Uh, I've had people tell me, uh, you know, when I've, when I've presented myself and they say, tell, you, t t tell me a little bit about yourself. And, uh, you know, I led more than not with, um, you know, my successes with the Army, being a platoon sergeant, you know, being an Audie Murphy awardee and all this, that, and the other, and all these accolades and so on and so forth and things that I did and the ways that I led my soldiers and whatnot. Um, and I've had responses, this isn't the Army, though, right? And so, um, and I, I was extremely taken aback by those types of, uh, those type of responses, you know? And so I think it's important to just understand that, you know, you're, you're in a completely different world now. Uh, again, don't lose those great soft skills, if you will, um, from the military and from the army. Uh, you know, keep those, of course, but when you're communicating verbally or in writing or what have you, um, just begin to learn to understand um, how that translates to, how, how that translates to uh, someone who hasn't served before, um, as opposed to me saying a civilian in a negative way, but um, how that translates to someone who hasn't served before. Um, so yeah, so, so those, those are some of my struggles, the resume writing, um, the interview process and leading with the military, um, and then also going into something that you are passionate about um, and something that aligns with your personal values um, and whatnot. Yeah. Great. Uh, Craig, you have anything else to add as far as your struggles? Um, I know I kind of started off with the struggles and things that didn't work, <laughs> but um, you know, definitely, Kevin, I, I completely agree because it is about understanding what you want. And I think the the part that I would like to share right right now is that that you know that was probably the biggest struggle. That was for me. Sure, transitioning into feeling like a civilian or letting go of the military a little bit was is was one thing, but you really do, or at least for me, I I really had to hone in on what was important for me. Um, Truth be told, the biggest reason I got out of the military is because my kids are in high school and I wanted to be in a place where they didn't have to move anymore. I wanted to be in a place where I was there for even the just little things like, hey, can I do my, can you help me with my homework? And to put that down on paper or have to say that to somebody else to go, no, I'm not willing to move. Or my transition is about being home. Um, cut things out like, nope, I'm not gonna work in Virginia. Or I'm not gonna work in DC or I'm not gonna work in San Antonio. So I think it's important to really hone in, not just like, oh, I'd like to do something involving leadership, or you know, I've always managed troops, I wanna do something that involves management. That's, and, and uh, that's completely true, but that's a really easy answer. And it took a little bit of time for me to find the hard answers that I'd like to be able to be closer to home. I would like to be able to know that um, a good consistent paycheck is important, not necessarily a big humongous paycheck that's gonna take me away from some of those things that are important. Um, finding something that I love and finding something that I feel passionate about is definitely important. But just like what Chris was saying, sometimes you have to just get that machine going, get that process going and work here, work there, and just understand that this is getting you to your goal. Um, in the military, what I really kind of understood later is we're so used to, hey, in three years, you're going to be uh, stationed at Schofield Barracks. You know, hey, you're going to be going to Korea. Hey, you're going to be going here. And it was, we didn't feel like we were like told what to do, but we were told what to do. And then all of a sudden, all those things kind of drop out and we're like, okay, so now you're a civilian, go find something. Well, is my resume okay? Is, uh, where do I look? What's my job thing? Or, or can I go talk to somebody? And it's different. It's different. So, you know, figuring out what's most important to me um, was really, really the biggest challenge. Um, I realized later on that community was really important to me. 
not just like my local community, but finding community is something that all of us in the military, I'm sure, uh, realize at some point. It was great to be deployed here and there, but it's even better remembering those people you worked with. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to know that, you know, this is a community, just talking to you and realizing that me and me you and have the same, same kind of struggles, just like you were saying earlier, looking around and going, yeah, I went through that too. Because, you know, I had friends of mine that were retiring and I told them, hey, it, it, it's, it's real. It's real. The problems are real. It's not like, you know, we're suffering specifically from PTSD or whatever else, but it's like getting out of the military is not easy. And uh, I had to treat it. I had to realize that I needed to treat it like a job also. That's, that's something else. Right. All right. So the next I thing can, really... I can kind of caveat, can I caveat yeah. on that real quick? Huh? Yes. It's, I think we all just have to realize too, you know, even if you're military or civilian, you're, you're going to run into failure and you got to realize you're not the only one who you're not the first and you're not going to be the last. And sometimes you just have to reach out. And like Craig said, with the community, you know, get connected with people, you know, they might not have all the answers for you, but sometimes it helps to have someone actually say, Hey, I know you're going through a hard time right now, but you will get through it and things will get better because I said uh, on a previous uh, webinar, you know, for like, for me, a low point was I had a job uh, as a, let's say it was basically cutting grass. And uh, I went through the interview and I thought I'd, I thought I nailed the interview and then I found out I didn't get the job. And so for me, the low point was, wow, I'm not even good enough to cut grass and pick up trash. And there's nothing wrong with that job. And that's not me knocking that job. But for me, I was just like, I was looking at my self-worth, but it took me reaching out to other veterans, other family members, friends for them to be like, hey, man, it's OK. You, you know, you're going to run into some setbacks, but you'll get through it and you just got to keep charging. Right, that's a good point. Um, yeah. So this one's not really a question. I kind of want to elaborate more. So hopefully, maybe this will help out uh, the people that are, are are logged in here. So, so Kevin, you you mentioned about the mentorship and the resume writing. So I'll talk about the resume writing one, just because I see a lot of resumes from from my current job and trying to help out veterans. Uh, so I think there's two two sides of uh, two spectrums of resume writing. You know, people feel that they have to put so much information to bombard the resume and then some people just put maybe one-liners on resumes there's like it's really hard to find that medium to put that to refine a, a good template a good resume they either sell it for short or they just use too many words and just they just throw up all these words on a piece of paper it doesn't look good in their minds they're feeling that they, they don't want to sell it for short so they want to add all this great stuff but the civilian side, like you said, they don't really care about, oh, you got this? Okay, let's, that's, that's in the Army. That doesn't matter. You know? So what, what helped you? Um, what's tips that you can give to help refine? What, how did you do to refine your resume, one? And then what did, how did you take away from mentorship to guide you as far as your translation from the civilian side or sort of military to civilian side? How did you work that? So kind of elaborate on more tips to help, help the veterans out on how they refine their resume and then actually utilize the mentorship out there. So Craig right. and Kevin. So uh, transitioning my resume and mentorship. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, um, and I'm not sure the ex military experience level of everybody um, who's listening in, that's not a panel member or panelist, um, but I'll be honest, uh, one of the things that helped me um, most was having been a platoon sergeant and been a, having been a non-commissioned officer and having written NCOERs, right? Um, and the understanding that, um, and I, I was one of those NCOs, uh, I, generally wrote my own in COER and I gave it to my supervisor to sign off on. Um, especially when I really start to understand what I wanted it to say for me and how I wanted to represent myself, right? Um, and when I really understood what quantitative and qualitative meant, 
right? And so it's the same thing with your resume. You know, you want it to be quantitative and you want it to be qualitative, right? You want it to represent uh, your qualities, those soft skills that you possess. You want to be able to communicate those best as possible to an employer and those things that have resulted in some uh, quantitative benefit for your organization. Um, you want to be able to communicate that as well. So understanding, the, understanding how to communicate and represent yourself uh, and bold yourself well, um, quantitatively and qualitatively. Um, and then another thing I did is, uh, you know, going through the whole transition um, process, going through ACAP, they called it in the Army, um, Army Career Assistant Pro Assistance Program or whatnot, um, or whatever they call it in whatever branch you, you, you are in or were in. Um, just going through one of those seminars and I sat through one with an actual, um, you know, military hr person I'm, I'm i'm losing the term for exactly what they what they call themselves um but getting getting that advice as well from hr professionals so I, that, that's really 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 important um some of the people that i reached out to whether i knew them or not i tried to reach out to as many people and i have a, a friend or a few uh who work in hr and what do you look at when you're looking at a resume, because at the end of the day, you hear all these stories about, we look at resume, you, you may take an hour, two hour, three hours to write them, we may take one minute, two minutes, three minutes to look at them. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so how do you make yourself pop out? You know, how do you decide what's, what's gonna be that first bullet um, and what's gonna be that last bullet? And how do you decide how many bullets? You know, for me, um, one thing I learned, not to go on too long, but um, I try to keep it as, as, as much as possible. You know, I use that old rule of thumb, no more than two pages to a resume. And then uh, another rule of thumb I try to use is I try to have more bullets that are one liners as opposed to two liners, you know? Um, and so that's that. And, um, and, and as, as far as mentorship is concerned, um, not only using that mentorship to talk about what direction you want to go as it relates to career, but using that mentorship, those mentors that you've used um, and had those conversations with to also allow them to look at your resume and give you feedback and be open to that feedback, you know, from those mentors. Um, that's a very important thing because, you know, uh, you know, we can't always see the donkey tail growing from my butt, you know? So what I use, so a mentor that I got connected with through Higher Heroes USA helped me out a lot. So I got connected with a mentor in my career field, which is HR side. And then, so she was able to explain to me all the stuff that I do on the Marine Corps side, as far as the HR field or admin field, and how it translates to the civilian side. Because when I, when I first started off, I was like, well, how, I had no idea about the civilian side and how am I going to translate it and you know, what experience am I going to bring to the table? Am I going to be able to either manage or work in a civilian side? Because all my experience is, is in, the, in the military side. Um, but again, she kind of assured me of, explained to, I explained to her what I did. And she was like, yeah, this is what this is. This is what we call it in the civilian side. This is what we do. So it pretty much correlated and pretty much was spot on as far as, again, different acronyms, different meanings. But it's the same thing that they do that we do. So I was able to elaborate a little more. Uh, what help with next stop with their refinement for resume but i was able to uh, spit down on my bullets to make it all 100 percent civilianized uh, even down to the awards i received i didn't make it you know accommodation uh, the marine corps accommodation medal i didn't do that i just i kind of civilianized it you know maybe recruiter of the year award instead of what we call it in the, in the, marine, in the marine corps side so those type of translations to me it, it helped out tremendously um, so we'll kind of move on. We talked about, again, the struggles of, of the resume and mentorship. Now we'll kind of move on to the interview process of what you experience. Uh, so Craig, I'll let you go in first as far as your preparation for your interview process when you started off. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, kind of like how earlier you asked about the, the negatives. Uh, for me, interview process-wise, before I even worked with any veteran programs, I, I had an interview with a government uh, contractor type thing, and it was probably about two years ago and uh it was via skype never worked with anything virtually before uh and and the biggest advice just right out the gate is prep your tech prep your tech know that if you're going to be on a, on a virtual type platform you know practice with that stuff set up your camera set up your lights see how you look like um 
because at the time I didn't know, this was two years ago, I didn't know how that was going to work. And so I, I was a little bit late to the interview. I mean, I was there, I had everything set up. I started opening everything up, but everything just wasn't clicking the way it needed to right away. And then, um, you know, lots of questions from different people. And in the end, I had to type a, like an actual writing sample and then email it to them right then and there. So it was like, I got to do what? I got to, I got to type something like right now. And so it was, it was very unique and I didn't understand it. And then, so fast forward to like six months ago or four, three months ago, uh, I had an interview just recently, um, which had me initially work with two people that was, that were doing the interviews back and forth. And that was, you know, co very comfortable. And I was used to, uh, to talking on, on zoom and all these different platforms by now. And then the second part of the interview, which was very interesting, I had to do it. I had to teach a class to like 15 people on a panel, on a, on an audience, because basically it was their morning meeting on Monday. And so I had from like Thursday to, to Monday, I had to prep a class, put some material together and then teach it via, via online platform. So it was, it was really, really surprising, but I was ready for it because this time around I used what I, I you know, what I did before to kind of figure it out by um, reaching out to my friends, reaching out to my family actually. And I had my kids in different rooms of the house and I taught the class like on Saturday before the Monday. And I taught the class to my, to my wife and my kids. And then I called my friend who was in, uh, in Las Vegas and I had her go through the class and I had taught the cl class virtually. So preparation, my, the biggest thing of, of everything else is preparation, you know, practice, any sort of interview prep class will tell you practice, 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 but especially in, on the virtual side, the biggest advantage we have, you have now is that you control the visuals, you control what they see, you control how they hear things, and you have the ability to, unlike in-person interviews, you have the ability to control all those things ahead of time because you can set the stage. So it's nice to know that, oh, it's going to be on Zoom or it's going to be on GoToMeetings or it's going to be on Microsoft Teams, whatever it may be, you have the, the ability to, to prep ahead of time. And then um, what someone told me a while back is go ahead and Google interview questions because even though they may think of questions that may be unique to that job, they're all going to be around the same idea and just practice those questions. There's top, look up top 25, look up top 50 interview questions and then just practice those, you know. And not just like to yourself, you know, that kind of thing, but like in front of somebody on a camera. Um, and then another piece of advice I would throw out there when you're doing virtual, you know, interviewing is you have, you know, the ability to, to put notes in front of you. In a real interview, you don't really have that. So have your resume up, have those interview practice questions up. So when they ask those questions, you stare directly at the camera, but you can still look at your notes. And, and you know, if you practice well enough, you're not going to look at the notes. But um, interviews are, are, are very, you know, very dynamic in what we do, but because we're virtual, I, I think uh, there's a lot of ways that we can take it to our advantage. Right. That's awesome points. Uh, I want to bring it to Dina, actually. Do you have anything else to add as far as preparation for an interview? Yeah, I would just say the biggest thing is make sure that you, you know, to go along with what Craig said, um, preparation is key. So, uh, make sure you're researching the company, you know, try to reach out to other people that work there um, to get any bit of advice you can prior to the interview. Um, that's definitely going to help you a lot. And remember that the interview is a two way street. You know, they are really they, they like you on paper. Um, you're going to get in there and answer questions, uh, mainly behavioral based questions. Um, so you know, know your strengths, know your weaknesses, but it's also an opportunity for you to interview the company. So make sure that you have questions prepared for them if there's things that you don't understand or would like to know more about. Um, you want to make sure, you know, again, to go back to what Craig said I'm, and John mentioned, I'm retired Air Force. So I spent 20 years in the military with, you know, somebody telling me what to do and how to do it. And now it's really about what makes Dina happy? You know, what makes any of us happy? Um, so you want to make sure that the company is a good fit for you, you know, in all aspects. Is it going to be a good work-life balance? Is it going to be, you know, a realistic job? Is it going to be something that makes you happy at the end of the day and gives you that job satisfaction? So, you know, research the company, make sure you go in there and, and you know, and if they ask you questions about the company, you can answer that. But again, you know, make sure that you guys are, are prepared in 
having questions for them as well. I, I would say that was something that I did not do. You know, I had plenty of interviews when I retired from the service and you just, you know, we like to say you don't know what you don't know. And even if you get an interview and you think, well, you know, you know, like Chris said, going to cut grass and, and pick up trash and that wasn't his dream job. But even if it's not your dream job, use the interview as practice. You know, there's nothing wrong with that as well. Awesome. Great. So I'm, I'm going to talk about my first ever, I guess, interview as I was transitioning, you know, during my retirement. And you know, I'd like to give you guys to share your experience, um, you know, maybe your bad experience and how you over, overcame it. So I'm going to go over again, mine. So again, we're all experienced. We all have the confidence in the military. I was able to, to brief, you know, colonels and, you know, whatnot, hire, um, chain of commands and meetings and talk about my MOS and um, brief a large number of, of, um, of Marines or you know, soldiers or airmen. We all had those that experience and confidence. But for whatever reason, when it came down to interview time, I was, I was nervous. I was done. So uh, this is my first job interview. This was, again, my dream job. So every time I put in my application and got a call, for whatever reason, this was my dream job. This is, my, this is it. This is a, an awesome job. You know, I want it. I got to have it. So this job was, uh, it was a contracting for, for uh, the uh, veteran, for VA, for medical appointments as far as the, uh, the uh, veteran process benefits, right? So again, it was towards the VA claims, uh, medical processing, so working with veterans. So that was like in my wheelhouse. That was awesome, right? Again, dream job, excited about it. I got the phone call for an interview. It was, it's, you know, it's awesome. I go in there. I, I'm done. I'm, I was, again, I'm naturally an inter, introvert. I'm kind of like, you know, reserved. Um, but at the interview, I just froze. Um, that interview lasted five minutes, I want to say. It took me longer to get to the building and to sit down than the interview itself. They, they asked about maybe five questions, and I literally asked, uh, answered them with a yes, no. And yeah, I can do that. Like, yeah, sure. Like, I wasn't elaborate, I didn't elaborate, I didn't bring my skills verbally, I didn't articulate anything. I just said yes, no, I froze and shook their hands and walked away. And I left and I went inside my car and I sat there for about 10 minutes just shocked, like, what what the hell just happened? Like I just ruined that job, right? I just they're not gonna call me back. Um, so of course if they didn't, um, and I kinda I sat and re rewound the whole event. And I just, I knew I should have elaborated. I should have sat there and discussed what I brought to the table. I should have, you know, did my, talk about my experience, but I didn't. I just said, yes, no, sure, whatever. I just kind of kept straight to the point. Uh, not personable. Again, so interviews to me, like Dina was saying, uh, they're more, they're more feel, filling you out as far as do they want to work with you? So me sitting there, you know, stone faced and just saying yes and no answers and not having no personality. I bet you they're saying, I'm gonna work with this guy. This guy's like crazy. I don't want, he's gonna sit there and stare at me all day, like not say anything. So of course, I was an ideal candidate to sit next to you all day for eight hours. So again, so that was my first, I guess, throwaway interview. And what I took from that, of course, was to bring my personality, articulate more and, you know, make eye contact and, uh, you know, prepare myself a lot more as far as the background of the uh, company. And just be, again, at the end of the day, be personable. Um, so with that, I'm going to go around the room here. Uh, Craig, I'll start you off here. You're on top there. You want to talk about maybe your bad experience and how you overcame that? Well, I, I'll keep this one a little short because I know that uh, the last one was a little bit about interviews. But, uh, you know, it's kind of like, like exactly like you're saying, though. You come in there with, with that automatic m military mentality. And I think it's a it's an interesting balance because we've got to figure out how to value ourselves because sometimes as, as military people, we don't put enough stock into what we do. And at the same time, we flip it the other way. And then we want to talk about all this military stuff and we don't know how to translate it. So, you know, I would say that interview wise, um, as far as pitfalls and things that I dealt with, you know, before COVID and everything else, I had a lot of in-person interviews and a lot of times I did practice questions. But, you know, just like you said, um, you know, I didn't bring my personality and I thought I'd, I'd look too comfortable, too casual. But the thing is, I wasn't looking casual enough. You know, I wasn't smiling enough. I wasn't, you know, I, I could talk. Great. I was a recruiter. I could talk. But at the end of the day, I needed to 
put together stories. Like, you know, if you're like in the military, we may feel like introverts or extroverts, but when, we, when we're in an interview, that's the showtime. That's the time for us to get out there and, and put it all on the table. And, uh, you know, sometimes we forget to do that because we just answer this question, go, go. Um, but, you know, as far as for me, interview wise, I, I, I just kind of go back on the idea of, you know, figure out, you know, your value. You, you, we've all done a lot more than we probably give ourselves credit to, but now learn how to speak on that and learn how to explain that to somebody that knows nothing about you. And uh, elevator pitches, people may phrase that in different ways, but here's 30 seconds, talk about yourself. That's, that's another key one. How can you make yourself sound important, not fake important, but how do you, you know, put that value in front of somebody in a short amount of time? That, that was always a good practice that I did. And uh, I worked with a group called uh, Four Block, and I was a cohort for them in Houston for, for nine weeks. So for nine weeks, every time we had a meeting, whether it was virtual or in person, we had to do our elevator pitch again. So every single week we had to do it again. And every single week we had it with a different company or a different organization. But our group of 12, 12 veterans got to hear our pitch change over time. It's like, oh, he didn't mention college this time. Or, oh, he didn't mention being a platoon sergeant that time. Just we, we could see each other getting better. So you know, it's, it's, it's good to get peers to kind of listen to you say, you know, why you're important. Awesome. That's good. Uh, Kevin, you have any, you have a horror story as far as your maybe interview? Oh, you're, you're on mute. Got you. Um, horror stories for me, I'll say, uh, you know, kind of talking about, you know, what Dina talked about as well um is not knowing you know when you're in the military it's so much focus as you're transitioning out on getting your resume together i think there's less uh practice or less talk about interview um decorum if you will but uh i think one of the horror stories that I've, I've I had was not knowing enough about the the organization um that i was applying to um and i mean when you don't know enough about the organization um it, 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 it's it's not a great thing because a very common interview question right a very two common interview questions is um what do you know about the company right and then another one is why this company right if you know nothing about that organization, you can't answer what do you know about it and why you want to work at that company. And at the end of the day, um, you know, you're interviewing them just as they're interviewing you. And so when you don't know enough about the company, it tells them that they're not sure if you're going to be a good for, fit for them because you don't know if you, you don't know if they're going to be a good fit for you, if that makes sense. Um, and so just, you know, as you know, like we say in military terms, you know, reconning the company. And then the one thing I want to add is, uh, you know, with that is not necessarily just knowing about the company, but it's okay when you get that call for an interview or uh, an email, because uh, this is something I've learned over time. Um, you know, it's okay to ask who's sitting on that panel, right? And Google them look them up on Facebook, look them up on Instagram, you know, become their friends virtually before, not, I mean, don't send them a friend request. I'm not saying that, but get to know who they are because sometimes you may be able to make a little joke here and there, you know, uh, you know, not sarcastic, but, um, you know, bring up something here and there or find a connection with them here and there um, to, where it, to where it may actually end up being a good fit for you and the company or looking them up on LinkedIn um or what have you um that, that's an important thing my my um wife actually she works in corporate america and she pretty much always has um she's never been in the military um and i remember her telling me that it looks kind of weird when you're get when you're having an interview that's coming up uh and you don't see because you know on linkedin you can see when somebody has searched you and it's kind of like this person hasn't even looked up me or looked up the company, you know, they look at that kind of stuff. So the same way, you know, they, 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 they look at your Facebook, they look at your social media. And I know you're going to get into that, John. Um, but that same way using social media as an advantage for, for yourself on that interview and getting, getting to know them and showing that you're interested, you know, but not, of course, not in a weird way, you know? That's good. Hey, uh, Patrick. 
you have any ex an experience or uh, bad experience in the interview process that you went through when your transition you want to share? Yeah, I had an interview for a uh, to be a manager of a multi restaurant uh, like market here in New Orleans. And I had to the interview process, I went through one interview process, total my salary expectation um, based on my experience uh, in restaurant management. And they sent me to a second interview. But my second part of the interview was I walked around with a possible future employee learning everything she did as far as like cleaning tables, interacting with the different restaurant, restaurant uh, owners there. And uh, little things like something that would fall, would fall under my purview. And uh, so I, I, I showed up to work in a uh, in uh, interview attire, but I ended up doing uh, uh, wiping tables down, and then ended up where they hired the head person's son to do the job. So um, I felt like they was wasting wasted four or five hours of my time of the day that day. So that was probably the worst interview I had. Okay, so you kind of bring a point I was I, I didn't mention as far as the attire. So. Again, it's not always cookie cutter, wear, wear a suit, so like yourself. So maybe the experience that you have now, you might, have, you might ask the recruiter or the, the hiring manager, hey, what, what attire should I wear for this certain interview? You know, do I have, you know, that way they can tell you, don't wear a suit, wear something comfortable, because by the way, you're gonna be cleaning something or you're gonna be in the back, maybe in the kitchen area walking around. Um, so again, don't be afraid to ask those questions as far as what to wear. Like Kevin said, who's gonna be on the interview? Who's the panel interviewers? That way you know exactly who you're talking to. Um, get to know them. You know, so uh, great, great point, Patrick. Uh, and then so, can I throw something else out there with that with that yeah. whole piece that Kevin mentioned too? Is um I, I really liked using LinkedIn a lot in that like you know as far as seeing who's going to be in the interview or seeing searching on the company and then just kind of networking who's in that company who is the hiring manager who are the other hiring managers because maybe that hiring manager is reaching out to you but they're not the one that's always going to be talking to you and then making sure that when you request somebody always throw a note in there I, I, you know because that way they're not just feeling like you're just spying on them or creeping on them on, on linkedin but it's like hey i'm, I'm doing this because at first i was really apprehensive about doing that thinking what if i don't get this job or what if this but at the end of the day, you're building your network. At the end of the day, if this job interests you, that may be somebody or some company that you may end up going back to later on. Uh, why not create a connection? Because it isn't specifically Facebook or Instagram or whatever. This is LinkedIn. And people treat that as a good way to, to make positive connections for, for careers. Um, you know, Make as many connections as you can and make notes to them so that you can speak to them. Because um, I've had people reach back to me after I... I applied for a job, didn't get it. And they're like, Hey, so how's this going? And I'm like, wow, you're really okay. And you know, they're able to keep, keep that relationship going. Great. Good. Uh, so with that, I'll kind of talk about social media as far as how that plays in a role in your transition. Uh, so again, I'll kind of start off with me again, as, as, as you know, I told you guys, I'm an introvert. Uh, I'm not really inclined to uh, light up a room and have that charisma and shake hands and, and get those connections personal, personally. Uh, some people have that. Some people can stay in, in a line at the grocery store and have a conversation with the person next to them. And next thing you know, they might have a job interview or they might have that connection right there. Um, keep my head straight, do what I gotta do and leave type of person. So uh, LinkedIn for me was it's a great tool for me to have because again, I, I'm an introvert behind the scenes on my laptop, my phone. I can create my network and connections uh, you know, a huge piece of a network just from behind my laptop. Um, so I was able to connect with so many people. Uh, so I'm a big believer in LinkedIn. That's what I have. I don't have, I don't have Facebook. I don't have anything else. I just have LinkedIn and I, and I, I'm, it's, I love it. I'm, again, I'm a believer on it. Um, and my, my caveat of that is I started off too late as far as through my process. I believe you should start off maybe LinkedIn if you want to, it's not for everybody, but I think you should start off opening open an account if you do want to do it at least a year or, or more for your transition. Just because it takes time to build that, those connections to so learn your maneuver around LinkedIn or social media. Uh, for me, I started off maybe three months or so uh, before I, I uh, transitioned and my network and my connections were, were bare bones. It was, now it's getting a lot better. 
But if I knew what I knew before, I would have started a year ago, and might, that might have been a, a bigger impact uh, for me, for my transition. Um, so again, we'll kind of go, uh, Craig, I know you talked about uh, social media, but you have any, any tips and how it works for you? Um, you know, when I, like, very much like you, just getting into LinkedIn sooner than later, um, when I was with a uh, four block, they actually brought in somebody, um, from LinkedIn and he offered to look at the page. And so there's a lot of resources out there, whether it's, um, you know, other professionals you may know or family members to have them look at your page and see what they can advice they can give kind of like your resume. It should mirror your resume. Um, and the, the higher hero person uh, said the same thing, you know, look over your, it, your resume should match your LinkedIn and put as much information as possible in there that's that's impactful you know just like anything interview wise how you, you make sure you give them purposeful statements everything in linkedin should be purposeful i really used try to use linkedin a lot in fact i found next stop through linkedin i found dina through linkedin and, and all, all the people that helped support me through next stop was through linkedin because i was just searching from you know uh combined arms and and team rwb to you know to next stop and i didn't know what next stop was i really didn't um, and I learned it through through the reps here. Um, Dina was the one that helped uh, support my resume, look through it, that kind of thing. Um, but LinkedIn was, was is a big factor because I, I think of it as, you know, some people may not click on my resume. They may not click on things, but they're going to look at the LinkedIn piece and just kind of scan through it. And, and it should be able to tell you exactly what you've done, where you've done it, all that kind of stuff and be very detailed piece um you know the guy that worked with me through linkedin said hey fix your picture hey fix your background because at first i didn't touch any of that stuff i was like here just this is where i work this is where i went to school and it's done um and then to me i i avoid um putting social media related you know that kind of stuff on linkedin because i figure at some point someone may look through all of linkedin but at least i know that is an avenue where it's very professional it's always going to stay that way and um you know, as a, a Marine Corps recruiter, I messed with Facebook a lot because I had to do that on Facebook. So at a certain point, I just stopped posting things because I didn't, I got tired of posting all the time because that's what I had to do as a recruiter. Um, so then when I got into LinkedIn, I'm like, okay, I can use that same mentality, but do it towards my career. But um, I think LinkedIn is super important um, and, and there's definitely things you can learn from it. Awesome. Uh, Kevin, any, anything to add for our social media? How it helped you with your transition? Um, well, um, I agree with everything that Craig says as, as it relates to LinkedIn. Just making sure that uh, it reflects your your resume. Um, but the other side of social media is, uh, you know, LinkedIn is a is, is from, from you know more than anything is a very very professional, objective, if you will, social media um, site or what have you. Um, I think the other side of that is making sure that your that your other social media accounts are clean, you know, um, like your Facebook, your Instagram. I mean, um, you know, just in the climate that we are, to be honest with you, you know, I, I remember, and this is before social media even was a big thing. And I remember when I was back in college before the army um, and, uh, you know, I put down that I was in an organization when I was in the, you know, in college and whatnot. Um, and I remember my auntie who had already, you know, graduated college and, you know, gotten into the professional world uh, telling me, um, you might want to be careful about putting this particular organization um, on your resume because not everybody agrees with that organization and so on, so on and so forth. So it's the same thing with the kind the, 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 the comments that you post on social media, the, the articles that you may post on social media, um, the conversations that you may choose to engage in on social media um, or whatnot. Um, th those things are pretty important. Like when I spoke about earlier about how people look you up, um, just like you should look them up, um, people will to be honest with you, people will not give you an interview if, you, if they see something questionable um, about you that doesn't align with their values, their vision, their morals, so on and so forth, um, that you may post on social media. Um, so if, you know, if, if your goal is to be a professional in a particular organization or in any organization for that matter, um, you, know, I, you know, some things you may want to keep close to the vest 
are, uh, are, are, are not necessarily put on social media and just understand um, the importance of separating, uh, you know, work from home or work from your personal life or whatnot, you know? So right. that, that's my take on social media. Okay, awesome. So i uh, move it to Chris. Anthony, any more advice as far as social media to, for veterans to, to help trend, uh, leverage their employment search? Uh, I've, there's really nothing for me to say that already hasn't been covered. Is just, just get on LinkedIn. You know, uh, if you keep waiting, you're just gonna stay stagnant. It's what I noticed when I was in the army was that uh, it seemed like all the senior NCOs and officers they all had LinkedIn, and so and I, I feel like it kind of reflects when they actually got out of the military because it seemed like they were all going just straight from company commander to position at Golden Sachs, Deloitte and whatnot. And I think, I think that's the, was the big difference. We didn't use, not everybody, but me personally, uh, I didn't use LinkedIn to my advantage to actually start networking prior. So it's never too late to start today. Uh, I put my URL for my LinkedIn. I see Craig did as well. So if you want to connect, feel free to send me a connection request and we can talk offline or schedule something. I don't mind. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so with that, we're going to gear towards, uh, move it towards the audience. Well, we'll give it a few minutes here. Um, any out there in the audience, has, do you have any questions for the panelists? Good morning. Uh, how y'all doing? Um, this is Sean Holland. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Great. Um, just more of a comment, Justin. Um, any questions for you all? Great job on um, answering all those um, and and going to all those uh, different topics. I think it's very good. I am a retired Marine um, as well, and I am um, a um, employment support specialist with the National Guard. So um, I've been in the field for quite a long time. And I think you all ahead of the great topics of transitioning. Um, I also transitioned. And I think that um, those topics um, are very important. The social media, when I got out, I didn't have that um, situation with the social media. And now today, I am one of those that um, look at resumes I, um, through my career after retiring, looked at social media um, pages and all of those type of things. And those are very, very important um, things and issues that we need to consider uh, today. So those are out there, um, that social media and making sure your page is clean, making sure you have those um, good positive things out there in your pages are very good. And also your interviewing technique. I think that was very good to cover as well. Um, those interview techniques and making sure you're um, positive and um, being very competent in your way of you presenting yourself. And I, you know, I look at it as um, as a um, showtime. Um, I came out and I was a trainer at one point in my career as um, a civilian here and. Um, I always said um, it's showtime. So I am putting on a good show. I am making sure that I am um, presenting myself. And it's not so much act, I'm not faking it, but also I'm putting on that smile. I'm making sure that I'm presenting myself and I'm making sure that I am representing who I am um, at that time. So I think all of this is very important. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think a great job panel on um, presenting all of those topics. Thank you, I appreciate it, awesome. Uh, so again, just, again, I just can't stress this enough. This might not be a job fair or, or talk about jobs, but at the end of the day, you have, we have a small amount of people here on, on this Zoom conference call, but the resources, the knowledge, the network, the connections that they have, um, again, if you guys take advantage of this, connect with each other, and this may lead to something in the future. Uh, so this is kind of the, the whole purpose. You know, I appreciate the, uh, what you just mentioned. 
Um, again, that's just the overview and purpose of all this. Hopefully we can do a lot more. Um, and again, you have any other questions out there? Hey, John, this, uh, this is Chris Acosta. I'm uh, with the Marine for Life program. Um, so uh, we've got, we did a brief this last weekend with uh, H&S Company 123. I think you did yours on Friday. Um, yeah. But out of that, we've gotten, uh, just this morning, I've gotten nine requests to connect on our, our program. And 100% of the time, I send them to you as well. Uh, Will you be doing these more frequently? Because uh, a lot of the conversations I had with the guys were uh, was building your network and continuous networking and, and continuous development. So this is a good platform if, if you guys decide to do it. I think that we would have a, a pretty solid turnout with, you know, at least the Houston Houston Marines that are out there as well. Well, definitely. Uh, so, Chris, so next stop, ourselves, we host – I would say a number of events each month, whether it be um, uh, with companies. Last week we did Chevron. Next week we do, uh, we have a workshop with BP and we have something with Fort Hood with we have at least four agencies that's gonna jump on. So we definitely, we do this and I'm definitely gonna, this platform I wanna carry forward, hopefully maybe once a month and have different topics, um, you know, add some more people to it and just have, make it hopefully grow and to make it more of a social networking type events where uh, again, we can make connections and then help to help veterans out. So yes, a long Chris, story. I think. Yeah, sorry, I think if you want to also, uh, we can probably talk offline about it as well. You know, maybe we can have something specific for a group of guys that you have that want to do something like this. Oh, I, outstanding. Okay, yeah, definitely. So I'll, I'll reach out to you on this call. Yeah, awesome. awesome. And, and can I jump in real quick? Um, a couple of caveats that I just wanted to <clears throat> mention. I like the, the the gentleman who spoke earlier about just making sure you, you're confident when you go into an interview. That's that's one of those soft skills from mil from the military that you definitely want to bring out, right? But another thing, you know, when you're answering those questions, um, whenever it comes time, and this is this plays a part in the whole being prepared and practicing and so on and so forth. Um, and I'm sure Dina, John, you guys are familiar with this, but using a star format. That's like a big, big, big thing in the civilian world, right? Is using that star format when you're answering a question. And when you answer the question, um, people don't wanna hear just, uh, um, you know, hey, tell me your experience about driving trucks. Well, I drove, you know, two ton vehicles in the military, so on and so forth in Iraq or, you know, in that Fort Hood and that's it. Well, you know, they wanna hear star, Tell me about a situation. What was the task? Um, um, what was the action? You know, and what was the result? You know, of all of that. Um, so you know, it, you know, take up, the, you know, take the time to look up that star um, format and in answering um, interview questions, and that will bode you extremely. Some of my most most successful interviews have been when I've uh, used that more than not. So, awesome. That, that can't be out. Awesome. And just really quick, just to jump on what Kevin said about interviews, when you're practicing those questions, and this is um, a struggle that I had, you know, we're in the military and the only thing we're taught from day one is team. You know, it is all about team. It is not about you anymore. And then when you go into an interview and one of, uh, you know, my first interview that I went into, I was lucky enough, I didn't get the job, but I was lucky enough to um, get feedback after the interview. And the feedback was that I did not talk about myself enough. It was all about what we did and it's all about what our team did and what my team did. And it really wasn't about me. And at the end of the day, they're not hiring your team. They're, they're hiring you and they're hiring the skills that you're going to bring to the table. So, you know, we don't do it enough, but learn how to brag about yourself, learn how to talk about you as an individual and, not saying don't be a, you know, a team player and express that you're a, you know, a good member of the team, um, but really learn how to focus on how to talk about you because that is one of the things that um, I know myself and some other veterans that I've spoken to in the past have struggled with. So just really kind of separate yourself from what y'all did as a team and think about, like Kevin was mentioning, with the star, what was the situation you were placed in? What was the task that you accomplished and what was the result? And real quick, Dina, Dina. Something, something you just said, Dina, um, don't be afraid 
real quick, and I'll say this real quick. Um, any interview, don't be afraid to ask for feedback. You know, do not be afraid to ask for feedback. A lot of times, you know, you'll get that. Sometimes you won't, but please don't be afraid to ask for feedback because that's what that's what helps you grow with those interviews. So for that feedback, would you guys ask right after the interview or maybe give it a couple days later or something? How would you guys do that? Hey, Ada had a question for the, for the group. Yeah. This, this is actually Steph. I'm on a Ada's Zoom account right now. So thanks for bearing with me on that. So I wanted to follow up with what Dina said because I had the same struggle in interviews coming out of the Marine Corps. It's so hard to say I, right? We never say I. And one of my favorite mentors in the whole world, also a, a former Marine and now a business leader in oil and gas, he said sometimes, you know, he shared the same thing and, and he still does. And so when he goes into an interview, he says, you're going to hear me say team a lot because I'm a, I'm really team oriented. I grew up in an organization in the Marine Corps. And then again, in, you know, Shell, that was team oriented. Um, at the end of the day, I was leading that team, right? And I was driving a lot of the initiatives, but as a team, we delivered. And so then it prefaced why he was saying team so much, but that he was still leading it. So just one other option to consider. He was the first person to give me that advice versus maybe feeling like you had to go all the way to saying I all the time. And I thought that felt more comfortable to me. So just an option. But this is one of those things, guys, though, that you have to practice. Otherwise, you'll slip right back into we the entire time. Awesome. Yes. Yeah, with the feedback thing, like you asked, um, I would say, you know, from my experience, I have like, I don't let much time go by before asking feedback. And when I say asking feedback, um, well, well, I won't say that. I'll say it's important after an interview to send a follow-up, a follow-up email. So I, all, I always do that. What, no matter how well or not well I thought the interview went, um, I always have sent um, a follow-up email just saying how much I enjoyed, um, the, the interview, um, you know, also using that as an opportunity to further make connections with that panel um, member um, on the interview. And I don't send a, a you know, one size fits all email to everything. I, you know, the best, best practice, in my opinion, is to send one individually to each panel member that doesn't necessarily look exactly the same as uh, the last. Um, and then if about, based on what they tell you, as it relates to what time frame that they're going to get back to you? That's around about when I when I when I decide when I'm going to send my uh you know my email for uh follow up or um well feedback rather um or if I don't get any time frame you know maybe about a week or so seven days but um yeah definitely um doing that so awesome all right so I'll give it one more chance here any other questions out there or any other comments. Hey, John, Sean Holland here, um, retired Marine again. Hey, um, could you just elaborate or anyone on the panel elaborate on um, the importance, uh, if you all think it's important, on um, submitting a cover letter with your resume? I think for me personally, cover letter, I would only do unless they're asking for it. That's just me personally. Um, I'm not sure if I'm just hard-headed or, or whatnot, but I know some people are different. Some people put a cover letter for everything, but I'm only doing one if they're, if they're asking for one. And that's I'm going to chime in on this one, okay, John? So yeah. from a hiring manager perspective, a cover letter helps me if it's going to tell me something different than your resume. So if your resume is going to tell me the same thing that your cover letter is and your cover letter is kind of a cookie cutter thing, I'm just going to skip it, right? And But if your cover letter is going to say something like, I know, I know this job is a procurement role. I have spent the last 15 years on the project execution side, right? But I think I have a lot to offer in the scope development of major projects. And that's why I'm applying for this role, right? And I lo really look forward to talking to you more about how I think I'm a good fit and, you know, those kinds of things. So that was a very rough go at what, why you would include a cover letter. But to me, it's it's almost like in the military when you put a cover letter on a package for any kind of promotion or whatever type of thing or an award, right? We always send that blurb ahead and it should tell you why I'm sending, you know, there should be a reason to it besides I'm just doing it to do it is my thought. But I want to hear Dina's thoughts too. Sure. 
pretty much the same as you, Steph. Um, you know, with talking with HR, it, it's really, if it's required, absolutely send it, but make it different than your resume. Um, you know, your resume should align with the job description and you should make sure that you're tailoring your resume. So you're showing them how you can complete um, each of the key responsibilities in that job description, but your cover letter wants to say more or less why they should hire you. Um, again, if it aligns and it mirrors your resume, the recruiter or the hiring manager is just going to skip over it. And also, you know, if your resume stands out enough and the job's not requiring the cover letter, the recruiter really only has a couple seconds to scan your resume. So you don't want to provide them with two documents that say exactly the same thing. Um, but again, I'm, I'm with John and, and with Steph, you know, if the, if the application does not require the cover letter, unless you've done something spectacular that you need to put on there, I, I skip it. Thank you. Can I add one thing on resumes as well? Uh, so just in general, and we may have covered this, so I joined a little bit late, but if we didn't, resumes are meant for a couple of different audiences, right? So it's meant for the recruiter to screen through and figure out which resumes they're going to give to the hiring manager, right? And then for the hiring manager to figure out which, uh, which resumes resonate and they want to interview. And then for the interview panel to figure out who they want to recommend. So just remember that from a resume perspective, because as a hiring manager, like, I'll be honest, guys, I care less about the top blurb, right? Because everything I care about is the, what you did and what did it deliver, right? Not what you were tasked with, but what did you accomplish and what did it do for the organization? That's what matters to me. That helps me visualize you and my organization. But the recruiter is going to be looking at the other parts of that resume to figure out, do you have the base components of what this hiring manager is looking for? Right. So that I know if this is one I should funnel into the send it to the hiring manager or funnel into the recycle bin. So, you know, Dina, John, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that from the recruiting standpoint. But I think that's an important thing to remember about a resume. Bye, right, Steph. Great point. Um, do you have a question in the chat? Too? I've seen one question in the chat. Um, it came from uh, JP. It says regarding follow up. At what, what point would I have received interviewer contact information? For instance, a panel of interviewers, would you expect to have had previous correspondence via email with each other? Um, I can probably answer some of that for, for you, JP, if, if I'm reading this right. Um, sometimes you might receive an email from them, uh, from the people who are gonna be interviewing you, but it is okay, you know, during your interview at the conclusion, you can say, hey, is it okay if I, enter, if I can re receive uh, an email address so I can follow up? In most, in most cases, though, they're going to give you their email. Um, I, I don't see a, a point why they wouldn't, and that would probably be your best plan of action if you didn't already have their email. Does that kind of answer your question, JP? Awesome. Great. So anything else to add or any other questions? Yeah, same thing, you know, just ask for business cards and um, kind of what um, Ada was saying as well about the, um, the resume. Uh, one, one, one big lesson I learned too um, is trying to use some of those descriptors or verbs or what have you, you know, making your resume, um, and this is something that, you know, Tiffany and I talked about too, making sure your resume matches with the job description. You know, um, a lot of times we want to use a one size fits all resume and like this resume is awesome, right? So I should be able to use this with everything. And that's how I feel about my resume, to be honest with you, you know? Um, but at the end of the day, you know, the times where I've gotten interviews, especially interviews outside of education, um, ones that I've received has been when I've tailored my resume to what the, the 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 company or what the job description was looking for you know what i mean um using their those verbs those adjectives and so on and so forth that that experience that they was looking for um because a lot of times we can speak about ourselves um and things that we've done um and we may look at a job description and say hey we've done that but we we haven't said that we've done that in the way that they're looking for us saying that we've done that if that makes sense right so. All right, so I'm gonna close it out here uh, for sake of time.
Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but we did record this. Uh, so again, we're going to use this throughout the year. Um, and I, I'm for sure know that this is going to impact a lot of veterans out there. I just want to really truly thank you for your time. Uh, those that attended, the panelists, um, everyone at Next Stop, I really appreciate you putting this together. Uh, again, I want to do this again next month. You know, maybe we can get together and talk about a topic, maybe perhaps. Maybe um, we can go over the uh, new normal as far as tips and advice to uh, navigate through this new pandemic as far as job market, um, how to navigate the uh, virtual job fairs and virtual interview process and kind of elaborate more about that. Uh, but again, I really appreciate the, the, the feedback and the turnout here. Um, it was great. Uh, if you have any questions, just let me know, you know, or reach out to me on LinkedIn and my email. Um, I put it out there and that's all I have. Thank you very much for your time.